Hello and welcome to History 391. We're going into the last kind of full week of content now. Can you believe we made it? Um, and I want to talk today a little bit about concepts of kind of victimhood and the war um, and kind of build on these continuing discussions about, you know, how America's going on to experience the war, um, both in terms of Americans coming back from the conflict and, um, and new Americans kind of being generated, immigrants coming into the, the country. Um, I think that, you know, you start really by thinking about popular culture. I think that's not a small thing. There's a reason that I dedicated an entire week last week to looking at American films and American representations of Vietnam. That the American experience of Vietnam um, in many ways is kind of generated for the, the next generations and, and kind of perpetuated downwards as this as a very specific idea. And you see this a lot um, in American popular culture. I mean, you can pick so many films from the late 80s, early 90s and so on, where such and such a character, you know, they just mention very briefly, oh, he protested against the Vietnam War. You know, so, for example, a personal favorite of mine is the film Sneakers which I really recommend, where um, Robert Redford plays, you know, this guy who's, he, he's leading a group of code breakers um, and kind of high tech, you know, um, thieves kind of. And um, Redford's backstory is that, you know, he had basically kind of protested against, um, he had protested against the government during the Vietnam War. And this is, it ends up having an actual role in the plot, but it's such a kind of a, it's such a really effective shorthand in so many 1990s films for um, now you know who this guy is, right? Like he stands up for right, correct things. He stands against government um, overreach. Um, you know, he believes in world peace. There's all, you know, or he's a good moral person. The shorthand happens all the time. Um, and certainly, you know, you have a lot of kind of complications because there are, there is an enduring argument, um, you know, and I mentioned the 1997 book, Dereliction of Duty by H.R. McMaster um, in a previous video. There is, you know, there is an ongoing narrative that, that Westmoreland had argued at the time that the U.S. military effectively had to fight with one arm behind its back and everything else, that, that the U.S. government had failed the military. But although there are definitely, you know, Americans who hold this view, um, it's not that it hasn't gained traction, it's just it's one of kind of many different views and one of many different kinds of experiences. Um, I think the kind of more popular argument, the more popular discussion is this idea, you know, of, of veterans coming back and being mistreated in some way. And this dovetails into um, the POW kind of, you know, I don't know if, I, I guess you can call it controversy. So the, the reading for today is taken from a book by Christian Appy, American Reckoning. And this is a book that um, I used the last time I taught the class and I decided not to assign it um, this term partly for, frankly, pretty mundane reasons to do with scheduling and how much reading I was giving you and things like that. That was actually kind of a main driver. But also, although I like the book, um, Appy's coming from this very, very clear position, um, which it's valuable, I think, for me to let you know um, as you're going through the reading, that Appy was very much against the Vietnam War, but also, you know, he kind of, he's situating the Vietnam War within this broader kind of record of, I don't know the American crimes per se, but certainly this kind of broader sense of an illegitimacy or problematic to um, American foreign policy. So in America's Reckoning, for example, he makes very clear connections to George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq um, and things like that. And you'll see it in the reading for today, which, you know, he, he talks about this idea of victimhood and he's quite critical of the POW idea. And you see these things of the POW MIA flag, um, which I have seen actually flying over the post office here um, in, in Danville, Kentucky, um, and you'll, you'll see it all the time. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you have family members or maybe you yourself um, have had this flag before or, or put it up somewhere and the sense that, you know, there are people still over in Vietnam um, that are not being handed back to us. Although Appy is very kind of um, deeply, deeply critical of this, um, there were uh, issues with uh, POWs in Vietnam not being returned. Certainly there were others who were alleged to have been over that kind of either never came back or never existed. It's hard to know. Um, but the concept of, um, how do I put it? The, the framing of the POW idea kind of fits certain American narratives. So for example, the most famous fictional depiction of POW experiences is in The Deer Hunter, the movie, one of the movies that you watched last week. Um, and The Deer Hunter, the Russian roulette thing was a huge controversy when the movie came out. And, um, is not something that we have any evidence or even reason to believe that Vietnamese officers did. But um, other aspects of the POW camps, you know, keeping people in these terrible conditions and everything else we know did happen. Um, the most famous uh, prisoner of war, the most famous American prisoner of war in Vietnam, of course, was John McCain, who went on to become a senator for Arizona, an American senator, and ran for president twice. 
He ran for the Republican ticket in 2000 and he ran against uh, Barack Obama in 2008 um, and who passed away last year and had this very, very long and very, um, uh, I don't know if glittering is the right word, very, certainly very respected career as an American legislator. And, you know, uh, McCain had stayed in what was, you know, called the Hanoi Hilton, uh, which was a famous kind of, um, which is a famous complex for basically torturing people and everything like this. And McCain, you know, all these things that are shared about John McCain, um, for the rest of his life, he couldn't raise his arms above shoulder height because of the the torture that had been inflicted upon him in Vietnam. And, and this was something that, you know, it didn't happen to every single American POW, but it didn't happen to just John McCain either. And so this colors all this idea. So for Appy, in the reading, he kind of, he seeks to link it to this idea of Americans seeing themselves as the real victims. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. And it's a very interesting kind of, a, it's an interesting discussion. And if you look at particularly at the attempt to rehabilitate the missing in action idea going into the 1980s, I think it's a fascinating thing. And Chuck Norris makes a series of movies that are basically, they're basically revenge fantasies, really, um, where Chuck Norris takes a bunch of guys into, into Vietnam or into some kind of a place and kills lots of bad guys. Um, one of my favorite um, examples of this kind of transition and thinking about Vietnam or, or, or modification of the idea um, is the Rambo movies. And if we were in class, I would have shown them to you. Um, but the first Rambo movie is a fascinating movie. It's not, it's not a great, it's basically a B movie is, is what it really is. Um, but um, thematically, it's really interesting because the entire concept, if you haven't seen Rambo First Blood, um, Sylvester Stallone plays this guy, John Rambo, who's a Vietnam veteran who um, is kind of homeless or kind of has become kind of a, a traveling man on the roads kind of thing. And he tries to stop in this small town in the Pacific Northwest. He's just found out a friend of his has passed away, didn't, you know, um, uh, got sick from Agent Orange over in Vietnam. And he's traveling through the small town and the sheriff basically escorts him out of the town and, and Rambo decides to come back in and then lots of violence happens and the, the entire film is based on the idea that Rambo is clearly suffering from PTSD and has massive massive psychological problems that were caused by the war um, and that there is there's problems between his relationship with with his with his fellow Americans when he comes back and the film ends with um, Sylvester Stallone this kind of you know very muscle-bound action hero um, in tears crying and his commanding officer from Vietnam walks in and kind of carries him out and he's in tears and he's really upset Rambo 2 um, Rambo goes back to Vietnam and kills everybody. And basically, I mean, it's that, that's it. That's what happens in Rambo too. And so there's this really fascinating kind of shift that in this one kind of weird action franchise, you have kind of both sides of this coin of how do we think about either our prisoners of war missing in action or the unfinished business motif. How does this all fit in and, and what does it mean and how is it going to shape a way of looking at the war? I think one of my critiques of Appy's book is, you know, that Appy complains about this notion of victim nation and victimhood and everything else but I, I, I as I said I think there's validity to it but again if you are just reading even American novels watching American films just engaging in American fiction that's typically not the kind of perspective you're getting you're getting a little bit of that in the kind of the, the the missing in action films with Chuck Norris and everything else um, but I it's a component of the discussion it's not a dominant one this question of victimhood I think is however very important you think of the very the actual victims from Vietnam, you know, two million people from the southern part of Vietnam evacuating Vietnam is, I think, the only real word to use in the late 1970s, particularly as the Vietnamese communist collectivist policy start to hit. In fact, you have uh, numerous waves of what become known as the Vietnamese boat people, um, you know, leaving Vietnam and, and, and from basically 76 until about 1989. Um, they don't all go to the U.S. Uh, many of them go to other parts of Asia. Um, some of them want to go to the U.S. but aren't able to make it. They have to basically stop on the way. Um, people lose their lives while basically waiting offshore. Australia doesn't want them. Lots of countries don't want them. There's all these massive complex problems with um, the quote-unquote boat people. And it was this major phenomenon of the 1980s. Um, however, many of them, many Vietnamese did come to the United States and they became, you know, Vietnamese Americans and they joined the larger Asian American community. Uh, more about that in the next video. So um, I want you to make sure you read the reading please that's on Moodle and the discussion question for this video is um, I'd like you to please assess Appy's argument that the missing in action um, motif creates a sense of American victimhood.
So um, evaluate the reading and, and give me um, an evaluation of Appy's argument for what he calls the victim nation. Okay, thanks.